2015, he brought you internet-controlled explosives. In 2016, he brought you evil networked light bulbs. Now, he's back. Honestly, we're not sure why. So, please welcome to the stage, the voice that sunk a thousand ships, John Kingsley. Hello, Hackfoots! <laughs> this might be the best or worst thing I've ever done. Uh, I would preface by saying, uh, when, when, I initially, uh, when Mike initially asked me to open Hackfoots this year, my, imme my immediate response, mostly joking, was, can I wear a cape? Fully, <laughs> fully expecting the answer to be no, and then having to source a cape in very quick succession. <laughs> so, uh, it is an absolute pleasure to be back for a third time. Uh, you all having a good time so far? <laughs> Lovely. So, hello everyone. I am Hackfluence's resident nine-year-old, and this talk <laughs> is entitled, So I Heard You Like Engineering, A Cautionary Tale. Or, to give it its official title, uh, Yo Dog, I Heard You Like Engineering, So I Put Engineering in Your Engineering So That You Can Engineer While You Engineer. <laughs> Except that wouldn't fit on paper call. So, I'm John, that's my proof. Uh, the fluffy ball of crazy on the right is Oscar. He's how I rub a duck program, except with a rabbit. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the bottom right. Uh, please follow me, it's how I judge my worth as a human being. Um, yeah, by day, I'm the uh, engineering lead at a data analytics company up in Manchester, which means I get to do a lot of this. <laughs> By night, I do hardware security research and have a piece of paper that says I'm legally allowed to blow things up. Uh, in <laughs> fact, I'm currently work, uh, what's it, working on building out a workshop for that exact uh, reason, which leads to some rather odd conversations like, what did you do today, John? Well, I seared a chicken breast with an industrial heat gun. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> So, a uh, quick disclaimer, I am not representing my employer. Some of the photos in this talk may not be my own. Please don't sue me if you accidentally set yourself on fire during the course of this presentation. Uh, I, have a, I was going to have a whole new disclaimer for you this year, bodily injury, uh, except, unfortunately, since I didn't realize the height of this room, we are not going to be doing live demos. I will ex that, will, that will come into it later. Um, yeah, I am a trained professional on a closed circuit. Please do not try this at home. So, uh, State of the Union. Uh, not gotten much better since last time. Uh, if any of you were here last year, I did a lovely talk about how computer security is fine and we're all going to be okay. And <laughs> honestly, since then, I almost didn't need to write a talk this year because I could probably have just copy-pasted the front page of The Intercept. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, a quick update on Cybersecurity Awareness Month so far. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so in case you're unaware, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and within October we have so far had Equifax and Deloitte uh, demonstrating that even in big corporate everything is unencrypted in plain text and on fire. Uh, including Equifax, and I really love this, boasting in a uh, white paper by FireEye that FireEye makes them impregnable to targeted attacks in a paper entitled, quote, less secure than you think. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's like, that, but the weird thing is that there are literally people backing Equifax up in this, which makes no sense. That's like watching My Girl and rooting for the bees. <laughs> so, uh, we, we live in a world now where it is somehow acceptable for a company built by a few dudes in a basement somewhere to hire multiple 747s to ship magic thinking rocks halfway around the world in order to solve math problems which give them money. Uh, yeah, we have Las Vegas casinos having all their customer information exfiltrated <laughs> through their fish tank. <laughs> because the one thing that your fish tank really needs, as well as Ethernet, an Ethernet connection to your building control system, is its own Wi-Fi network. <laughs> um, we, even Apple decided to get in on the party this year by storing their user's plain text password in the password hint on new file systems. <laughs> 
basically, if we, we li if we lived in a world where this was the norm last year, we now live in a world where someone on the Windows core team thought, hey, let's move the font renderer to the kernel. And then six months later, you can render like HTML in IE and get kernel level code execution via malformed open type fonts. And <laughs> frankly, at this point, if anyone asked me to put a font renderer in my ring zero kernel code, I'd try and choke them out with my own MacBook charger. Because <laughs> that is the worst idea you could possibly come up with. We, it's like we've reached the point now where back in the 60s, we were worried that people were going to wiretap our homes. And now we're like, hey, wiretap, can cats eat pancakes? <laughs> which now gets even better, because there's a recent study which showed that you can use voice recordings shifted to ultrasonic frequencies to trigger most of these voice assistants. So instead of just robbing someone by going up to their door and loudly shouting, hey, Siri, open the front door, you can now really annoy your neighbor's dog while you're at it. <laughs> And, of course, we need to stop the next generation from turning into vertical binary. That, <laughs> that, for, some reason, still, that for some reason still needs to wear a hoodie. It's like, it's, they, they seem like obvious things. It's like how you get all these people who are shot at gunpoint, and you're just there wondering why anyone ever goes to gunpoint. <laughs> so, two years ago, I gave you a talk about breaking pyro control systems. One year ago, I gave you a talk about breaking IoT devices. I've never really talked about how to break things. So that led me to the question of how would I best teach reverse engineering? So that's part of what we're going to cover today, as well as the general security psych assessment, because frankly, I'm going to beat that dead horse back to life if it kills me. Uh, yeah, I'm going to provide. So here's how this is going to go. I'm going to provide you with content. I will ensure that you are content with the content, at which point I will then proceed to leave the country. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I have a flight to Baltimore tomorrow morning. You're all dead to me. <laughs> so, I'm also going to dispel some of the myths surrounding a lot of this research, mostly the fact that it can be hard. But one of my favorite examples uh, comes from a guy whose name has totally slipped my mind now, who was doing some packet inspection of ARP handling on IBM BMCs and noticed that the trailing end of ARP who has packets uh, occasionally contained code. Uh, not, not kernel code, fortunately, but it was apparently linking chunks of the IPMI management daemon across the network with every ARP request. Yeah. So. Uh, before we jump in on this, I'm going to give you a crash course on reverse engineering legalese. So, uh, what's it? I'm not a lawyer. This is what I've been advised personally. Consult someone who knows this stuff far better than I before doing these kinds of things. But effectively, it boils down to this. There was originally only one area in the DMCA that allowed for reverse engineering, that being for the purpose of interoperability. The idea being, if you have a file format and I want to make a reader for your file format, I am allowed to figure out how your file format operates so that you don't have a monopoly on readers for that file format. Now, only as of last year was there an official exception for the purposes of good faith security research. Before that point, it was very much a gray area. There, weren't, there, there, I, there have been very few instances where people have actually ended up being prosecuted over it, but there was no real defined protections for proper security research that involved poking under the hood. And while the, the good thing is that we now have this exception, the annoying thing is that it's only a two-year hold while uh, lawmakers in the US figure out how to fit it into the DMCA wording, which means that if we don't get any kind of response by November of 2018, we go back to the exact same situation again. But for now, there is a uh, what's it proper exception for this type of thing. So let's start with a practical example of hardware reverse engineering. So uh, about last November, around uh, about last November, around California, a number of these odd-looking boxes began to pop up, and what they contained after the countdown finished were these, which were at the time the first ever hardware device by a little company called Snapchat, uh, known at the known as Spectacles, and these instantly fascinated me because where everyone else saw a cool new gadget. I saw a, literally, you have a potentially hackable camera and a microcontroller built into a pair of sunglasses. 
if you could use this, this would be the, one of the most interesting things possible to write stuff for. So, I wanted to see how I could acquire a pair. You can see that I've got them, but getting my hands on these initially was interesting because for the first four months of launch, uh, these vending machines were the only way to acquire a pair, and there were only two of them in the entire continental United States, which meant that this happened. What? Okay, we're back. This happened. Uh, so, after making a few calls and... Oh, yeah. After making a few calls and conniving a friend of mine in LA to ship me some over, I finally managed to get my hands on some about a year before they came out over here and three months before they became available for online purchase, which I consider to be, frankly, a Sisyphean feat in itself. Um, yeah, it was about as sound a financial choice as buying an iPhone 10 instead of 165,000 Bs. <laughs> because frankly, only one of those is going to give you increasing returns over time. <laughs> so, I started looking at teardown and chip specs. I basically looked through every single thing. I ran down data sheets. I manually traced vias. I came up with what I think is so far, the best public specification of how this thing ticks. Um, so, it has a 135 degree, uh, what's it, slightly odd resolution camera due to the round video that it records. Uh, it has a, uh, an Amborella chip, which we'll get into a little bit later, running an ARM Cortex-A9 clocked to 1 gigahertz. Um, it has 4 gigs of RAM and 4 gigs of internal storage, a Nordic chip that handles Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, and then a tiny little battery. So, first things first, uh, they expose a Wi-Fi network. So, what's on that? Turns out, not much. They just expose a DNS server for reasons and a proprietary TCP server. But, we can get a little further into it using the detail from our hardware foray earlier. Because, guess what other devices use this same chipset? These guys. Uh, what's it? Phantom and GoPro both use Amborella A7s in a lot of their older models. So there's a lot of existing tooling that can pull apart Amborella files, which means that if you can tweak the memory locations a bit, we start to find some really fun things. For example, the fact that its internal code name is apparently Laguna. Um, and after a while, this kind of turned into, oh, hey, that, there's the Bluetooth pairing. There's the protocol communication file management, what? So it has many different firmwares. Only one of them is publicly available, as far as I'm aware. Um, for some reason, it has a list of hard-coded colors. This was interesting, because I found this about a week before Clear was officially a thing. So I'm a little worried that they're kind of like just sh shipping everything with this. Um, and effectively, what I was looking for was something that would let me pair it to my laptop and start to poke things, because the issue is that it only generally pairs over Bluetooth LE directly to a device that it has been authenticated against, which we'll get into later. Um, and effectively, what we know so far is that this appears to be very well designed, highly secured, and attacking it should be beyond the wits of anything but the most determined adversary. <laughs> so, uh, it runs, on the Wi-Fi side at least, proto buffers over TCP or Bluetooth LE, if you like that sort of thing. Uh, it appears to be encrypted using an AES. It seems to be doing Diffie-Hellman key exchange to generate a shared secret. I've not, my, I've, my guess is that it's uh, to do with the snap code thing we'll talk about in a second. It firmware updates using semi-standard Amborella binaries. Um, the firmware updates may be signed. I haven't entirely figured out how yet, but it doesn't seem to really affect the ability to poke new things onto it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you, well, it's like, you know your firmware's from Snapchat, but like, if you want to put other things on it, then I guess. Um, yeah, so basically the way that operates is that it's, you send a series of commands to the Nordic chip, which will then proceed to uh, flash the Amborella, and then the Amborella takes a chunk out of its memory, which I assume is the recovery image, and flashes that back to the Nordic. Uh, it ha 1234 that we talked about earlier is used for HD photo transfer. There appears to be some type of dev tool built into it. I have no idea how to activate them yet. 
Um, and the interesting thing is that it effectively, uh, the pairing sequence, it will, only, it will only connect over Bluetooth to a device that you effectively look at this, press the button, and then that authenticates it to pair to that device and only that device, which is why I am currently figuring out how to beat that. And what I came up with is something that I'm probably not going to be releasing because Snapchat are a little iffy about people throwing random code of theirs online. Well, my code, but their implementation detail. Uh, it's effectively an internal tool chain for hooking them to macOS and then sending arbitrary uh, information and firmware to them. So we've done the obligatory how does this work portion of it. Let's get to the annual <coughs> security quickfire. Yeah, so we talked about Equifax earlier. Real realistically, I think we've reached a point now where most people have realized they're not going to be beaten by NSA O days. They're going to be beaten by the guy that tries password123 on their employee accounts until one of them works. Uh, Equifax didn't really know this and just kind of went, cool, no one's going to poke our boxes. Um, a great example of this is the University of Virginia. Uh, not only founded by Thomas Jefferson, making it home to the most awkward African-American studies program in the country, <laughs> but also subject to a massive data breach way back in 2015, where they literally, someone in their HR department, blindly clicked a link, and then 1,400 employees' worth of social security numbers just disappeared, and then appeared later on Pastebin. Uh, yeah, th one of the biggest problems realistically nowadays has turned from a lot of these targeted attacks to people realizing, hey, you can just like tell a person to do a thing and they'll do a thing. Um, universities uh, have also done some slightly more worrying things, um, especially because they seem to love installing arbitrary applications that they trust because somebody else built it on everyone's machines. Uh, this is a thing called Bradford Network Sentry, which is on the face of it a decent idea. You have an app, you install it on a laptop, it scans it for viruses and then reports back to the network whether it's clean or not. Except most of the time I like to play a little game where I go, right, you're, you're taking all of your security and you're going to put it on the hacker's laptop. <laughs> yeah. Which wouldn't be so bad except for the fact that this particular agent you didn't need to put anything on the hacker's laptop. You could, you could just go to everybody else's laptops and like execute arbitrary code over like XSS in their guest portal and directly on devices. Oh, and, <laughs> oh, and also, uh, just to cap it off, ancient OpenSSL, uh, which I have poked them about a while ago, and they do not appear to be intent on poking back. Um, apparently, future dated GPS packets disable Stingray phone intercept devices because it thinks its license has expired. <laughs> Which, if there was a more pure example of uh, capitalism beating the intelligence community, I'm not entirely sure what this. Um, here's a Linux stack trace on a faucet. <laughs> uh, did you know the bank TLD provides you with extra security? Yeah. I really want to know how this one's going to pan out, given <laughs> Bluetooth range. Um, here's a US healthcare provider sending USB sticks to people in the mail and going, no, really, plug this in. <laughs> this is legitimate. You wouldn't know it. Yeah, don't, don't do this. Uh, this is the egg minder. Firstly, implying that eggs are apparently now important enough that you need to spend £35 on a smart device to hold them. But secondly, the fact that eggs are apparently now an item that need minding, <laughs> as if they're just going to walk off on their own. <laughs> it's like, I did, I did not realize we had reached that point of the egg apocalypse. Uh, yeah, this D-Link network switch uh, has an Ethernet port. No, HDMI port, which acts as Ethernet. <coughs> Oh yeah, no, it's not like it's not like Ethernet over HDMI. This is a six to twenty gigabit per second bridge link designed to stack them. Why they put that on HDMI? I have no idea. I'm not saying ATMs are trivial to hack, but a lot of them a lot of them seem to run Doom. I mean, I guess. Uh, if you like your exploits portable, here's a travel Wi-Fi router which just like gives up the ghost with cross-site scripting over SMS. 
Um, this is Sweden. Sweden managed to, link, managed to leak the EU's secure military internet, most of their citizens' private data, and the spec of all of their military vehicles to the Russians, uh, courtesy of the IBM cloud. <laughs> Uh, the one thing that governments really love, apparently, is engaging in post-hoc revisionism. That's a really obscure reference. <laughs> uh, yeah, so at this point, this, uh, it, everything's still such a disaster that Jar Rule's trying to promote it. It's like, yeah. So, let's jump into the next thing that I've been poking over the past year or so. So, um, I took a slight interest in things that could fly and potentially, potentially run into me uh, a while ago uh, after seeing one of these in the flesh, and as a result, had a look. Uh, started off with this, little, this, this one, which is the uh, what's it, Parrot Bebop 2. It, it's had some pretty funky things in the past. Uh, for a while, it didn't really have the concept of WPA2, although I'm not really sure whether that's really a good thing anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Uh, used to be able to do things like have unauthenticated root over telnet or a script on the file system which kills it outright. Uh, the first one of those things is fixed. If you can get into the Wi-Fi network, um, the second one isn't. If you give it a second here, it will... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that, that's kind of not supposed to be a thing. <laughs> Um, the internal spec for this is uh, similar to the spectacles in some ways. Uh, you've got the same ARM Cortex chip. Uh, Parrot appear to have rolled their own system on a chip with this. I can't seem to find any information on it. It looks like a, some kind of uh, custom setup. Uh, they've got ARM VPU for doing video processing, 8 gigs of flash memory and a gig of RAM inside, and a little thing for doing the Wi-Fi connection. Um, and the great thing about this one, uh, compared to some other models, is that it has a really easy-to-use API, uh, which Parrot are like really developer-friendly with this. They'll literally give you like a full-blown SDK. It, it is a little loose in terms of response times. I had a couple incidents where I told it to move forward and then stop, at which point it then started moving towards me, at which point I then began to think, oh god, this isn't particularly good before being hit squarely in the chest. Uh, but it is fairly... If we give this a second, it should ri rise up from its uh, silicon tomb to come and say hello. Oh. And <laughs> if given a second, it just kind of does. So. This is, this is a setup that I'm not really used to, where you're just being given all the documentation you could possibly want. So my immediate response was, how can I make this harder? So I decided to see if I could do some literal audio engineering and make it do tricks when I whistle. Um, so after a few evenings spent in my back garden looking somewhat like this and driving my neighbors insane, I managed to pull it off. Um, there are a few ways that you could tackle this. Um, I chose to see if I could leverage some existing tool to do the hard bit of taking all the microphone input and turning it into, um, what's it, wave data, and then actually f do the bit between there and the rest of it to make sense of that. Uh, it turns out there's actually a really good tool for this called SoundPeak, uh, made by a bunch of people at Princeton, uh, which takes sound data and translates it into graphs, or alternatively, if you figure out how to poke it, a stream of floats corresponding to different sound frequencies. Uh, this is the, the first working demo I had of it. If you keep an eye on the upper left corner, it's now detected that as a pattern, and then in the next 10, 15 seconds or so, it should proceed to... There we go. Uh, that is, in fact, a library that I will hopefully be releasing in the next couple of weeks, because it is just way too fun to write node things and then trigger them with various combinations of whistle. Uh, yeah, on, on to slightly more expensive follies. Uh, this is the Mavic Pro. Uh, it will give you heart attacks. Uh, it's on the smaller end of DJI's flying ways to make a hole in your pocket. Um, and the problem is, when it comes to their devices, they have a whole other level of money burners. 
and those are the ones that come with a nice defined API. Uh, the consumer ones are a bit <coughs> less happy. There are firmware dumps for everything. Um, there was a whole bunch of different subsystems on various ports. Uh, the Phantom has a bunch of existing documentation. Uh, fairly standard protocol. It's literally just effectively IP, uh, what's it, uh, TCP IP over uh, what's it, software defined radio and then a few other bits tacked on. This isn't Lightbridge, that's separate. Um, if you do an MMAP scan of it, you get three separate file systems, which are effectively uh, the camera, the drone, and I think there's a, uh, what's it, uh, radio extension or something. Um, age, uh, uh, ages ago, they used to store their firmware update passwords in their Android app. They don't do that anymore, which <laughs> makes things sad. Um, the Mavic is slightly more interesting because they've updated things since the Phantom. This thing runs Android KitKat. Uh, yes, there's a command you can send it over USB which switches a debug flag and lets you get root shells on it. <laughs> um, there seems to, the, the really worrying thing, there appears to be, I'm not sure whether, whether this is still a thing in their latest firmware updates, there used to be a list of devices for which this super debug mode was enabled whenever it was on the same network which seems a little iffy. Um, it runs OcuSync, which is basically their updated version of Lightbridge, which is a regular SDR interface. It has BusyBox on it and a few other bits restricted to one directory. Uh, you can get around that. Um, and it's generally a bit of, what's it, a lot of fun to uh, play around with. Um, the spec on the inside is a lot more powerful, which means that if you go poking things inside, you can, in fact, uh, do quite a lot in terms of onboard processing. It's got a similar Amborella core. Uh, a lot of these systems seem to use Amborella as their manufacturer. It has a fairly hefty VPU setup clocked at, what's it, the socks, the camera, the, the camera chip itself is clocked at 1.5 gigahertz. I have no idea what the VPU is. As far as I could tell, it was possibly four or something, well, like one, gig, well, no, four one gigahertz cores for like data processing and reasons. Uh, Etheros chip for Wi-Fi, another thing for SDR. Uh, eight gigs of RAM and four gigs of CPU cache. Yeah. Um, the key feature I'm guessing they picked the A9 for is that it has a 4K encoder built into it. Uh, this bit is coming soon. I was uh, planning on having a, a release date for this. It's not really working yet, but I, I'm in the process of building a nice C++ library for actually doing that STR from, uh, what's it, Linux or OS X or whatever your flavor of the day is, to allow for arbitrary control of it, hopefully in the same way that their more expensive models do. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna jump through slides here a little since we are beginning to head towards the end. Um, this is uh, something I came across uh, about a year and a half ago now which was a, uh, a friend of mine asked me to look into a system at a school they, uh, what's it, were working at, which effectively was doing uh, mobile hall passes. And if you're unfamiliar with what a hall pass is, the idea is effectively, if you want a student to go somewhere else in the school, you give them a slip of paper or whatever else to authorize them to be there. The, the, this particular school was doing it uh, digitally, but my friend had a few suspicions that this thing was a little bit off, so they asked me to take a look at it. And what followed was the longest formal vulnerability report I've ever had to write. Um, firstly, there was the four six-digit six numeric pins with no limitation on how many times you could try and brute force them. Uh, then there were the API servers on HTTP. <laughs> and the real meat of that was the uh, lack of user authentication where you could just kind of go, hey, I, I want to list off this entire school, and it goes, cool, you can have, like, everything. Uh, and not to mention that, you could get a live list of basically where they were all authenticated. So you could effectively track people moving through the school in real time. <laughs> and it's like, to, co to call this a garbage fire would be, like, a disservice to garbage fires, which at least <laughs> do good things, like shed light and get rid of garbage. And it's like, that, that, that one just kind of, like, left me pacing, and much like taking the advice of this particular article, <laughs> this is not a solution. Uh, their solution originally was to ch just change the endpoint names, which is not a solution. Uh, they finally solved the issue, uh, what's it, uh, earlier, about a year and a half ago. Uh, my guess is it's probably because their code base was 
the kind of thing where it's like, that's not going to buff out. That's, that's definitely not going to buff out. <laughs> so, all of, all of this, effectively, in these cases, tends to be just because some people wrote bad code. Now, bad code can generally be fairly subjective. Uh, for example, this is the output of a neural network designed to generate plausible sounding food names. Uh, I would consider this to be the instructions for new bean and pickle flavored dessert soylent, and <laughs> this to be completely insane. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I, I end, uh, and it's, it's just one of those things. It's like ba bad, ba good code can actually end up looking like bad code. It's like we have these things called Markov chains, which are really smart, but are generally used to generate new Rolling Stone headlines. <laughs> uh, and occasionally con confirmation that even robots hate Lagardia, uh, which I frankly consider to be a masterpiece. Uh, th this, this guy, this in, uh, yeah, this, this person basically took uh, all the reviews on Yelp of LaGuardia Airport, threw them through a Markov chain, and ge generated this thing with such lovely uh, things as, for example, I was delayed for two hours because I had endless money, and they were pissed off that they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, what's it? My family members forgot to take me to my luggage, which is one reason why I now hate both my family members. <laughs> And my, my, my personal, my personal favourite, uh, if, if you're unfortunate enough to be in a nightmare, I have a nice alternative for you. Go to LaGuardia, have a beer, and then have some sedatives, and finally just sit back and wait for the airport to be demolished. <laughs> <laughs> Topping it off with the seminal quote of, if you can avoid it, please do not look at my family. <laughs> uh, so, effectively, uh, what's it? Reverse engineering isn't black magic. Security is still awful. Drones will give you bruises if you mess with them. And the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, except for weasels, because those little bastards will get you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you very much for your time. And before I go, if the. We've all had a lot of fun here talking about this stuff, but if the real payload of this is to remind all of you that the only person who can make the lives around you better are your, is yourself, then I will have succeeded today. There was a friend of mine earlier this year, a member of this community who was killed, and that single event very much brought home for me the fact that we have an incredible amount of people in this community who do incredible things, but the time we tend to get together, especially at events like these, is ever so short. So when you're at events like these, Say hello to old, old friends, make new ones, cherish the time you have together, because you never really know how long you've got. And this goes for every one of you here today, because we love you, we want to see what you do next, we care about you. So stick around a little longer. Thanks.